This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Uh, what I want to talk about, so I've been, got interested in limb salvage a long time ago when I trained with Dr. John Porter. <clears throat> and I've thought about it a lot, and I don't have all the answers, but I think the disease has changed. And I think to try to, to treat these patients, we need to think differently than we used to train. So when I worked with Dr. Porter, he got this tremendous referral network for patients that had been recognized as having ischemia. And it seemed like a pure plumbing problem. And at that time, he was pushing bypass. And so basically, we could bypass almost everybody. We got high quality angios on them. And, and life seemed pretty simple. But I think things aren't that simple anymore. So you don't really have any conflicts of interest. I've just listed grant support for, for um, for completeness. So just a little philosophy to start with. So if you think about the history of humanity, we started out with the age of disaster. So people were afraid of storms and afraid of natural disasters. And then once we started living together in big groups, then we got infectious diseases because we lived together. And now we're in a whole different age. So we're in the age of decay. So that's brought on by aging, diabetes, obesity, and PAD. So it's non-communicable diseases now. And this landmark paper was published in British Medical Journal in 2009, which was the first time in the history of humankind where more people died of non-communicable diseases than communicable disease. So that's remarkable when you think about it. And this was an economic analysis. And if you look here at the upper right, this is risk. This is how, what, whether the event is likely or not. And this is risk to global development and economy. Chronic disease is actually one of the biggest risks to global development. If you think of it in those terms. And so it's a global emergency. Right now, one in 11 patients throughout the world has diabetes. And it wasn't like that when I started training. And diabetes overtook infectious disease as a leading cause of death in 2009. So if you look at the population, now that we're measuring it better in China, India, huge numbers of diabetics, U.S. is third. So maybe we, with Mr. Trump in office, we can make America great again and regain number one, but unlikely. <laughs> um, and then if you kind of look at these, I, I trained in the 70s and 80s, so you kind of look at what happened to this curve starting in the 90s, it's very steep. And then you add to that obesity, and one of the reasons I moved to Texas was because that's sort of where the amputation belt starts, and that's because of obesity and diabetes. So if you just look at, this is a slide I borrowed from Dave Armstrong, but if you just look at why do people with diabetes get in trouble, it's hard to, to get press off of this, but it's their foot. It's not their heart. It's not, it's not their eyes. It's not even their kidneys. It's a foot ulcer. And one in five diabetic patients that gets a foot ulcer eventually gets an amputation. So, and if you look at the five-year mortality, if you take PAD uh, with rest pain, for example, or you take a patient who's already had an amputation, or even a neuropathic ulcer, their mortality is as high as almost any form of cancer except for lung cancer and pancreas cancer. And then this is Dr. Barshas works with us, Neil Barshas. If you look at the annual cost of diabetic limb complications and compare them to the direct cost of the most common cancers, it's the highest. So if you put it in another way, about once every 17 seconds somewhere in the world, there's a person being diagnosed with diabetes. And about once every 20 seconds, a patient with diabetes loses his legs. So that's pretty, his or her legs. That's pretty um, diabolical, sinister math there, if you think about it in those terms. Now, the, the good news, I think there are a few speakers earlier that talked about this. There have, has been a decreasing trend of major amputations, at least in the United States. And these, I'm not proposing these are directly related, but if you look at investigations for peripheral vascular disease, they've been on the increase. So not only angiograms, endovascular therapy, but there's more attention being paid to revascularization. So there were some papers, uh, this was from the Dartmouth Atlas, if you kind of look at where amputations happen, there's regional variability. So this interests uh, medical epidemiologists a lot because what are the reasons for that? Are the patients different? Is the care system different? Is it some combination of both? But the amputation belt kind of starts in Texas, and it's mostly through the southeast. Uh, and then you look at amputations in Medicare patients here, same thing, same kind of thing. Now, what's interesting, so this was the first paper that came out from Good News Group, and if you looked at attention to vascular status, so 
did the patient get a revascularization in that, in that region, or did the patient have an open surgical bypass, or did they even have an angiogram or some investigation of vascular disease? In areas where more of that activity happened, there were fewer amputations. So on the one hand, paying attention to vascular disease is important, but on the other hand, spending more money is not, is not better. So if you look at costs for procedures, the areas that spent more money didn't necessarily have fewer amputations. So if you look at this slide, people that, in areas where there were only 2.2 revascularizations in the population, uh, the amputation rate was quite high. But once you started getting up to four and five and six revascularizations, there was no improvement in limb salvage. So it suggests that you have to use your revascularization judiciously and doing repetitive revascularizations just costs more money and doesn't necessarily help the patient. So this, this is how life seemed simple to me about 25 years ago. This guy shows up. I was working with Dennis Bandick. His foot was debrided. It's cleaned up now. had bad infection. Had a good popliteal pulse, no foot pulse. And infection's controlled, but you can see the wound's not granulating yet. There's exposed bone. So he gets a little bypass to his bifurcation. All the vessels fill. I do a transmet and skin graft. Done. Pretty simple. So I went about doing that for a long time. And then you start reading papers about subintimal angioplasty. So this is an example of a long anterior tibial lesion. And I started thinking, well, that's interesting. What am I going to do with that? So then I started thinking in broader terms, well, blood flow is only one component, right? So you can fix the blood flow part. But then it started to dawn on me my patients were changing. So what don't vascular surgeons do? We don't really run prevention clinics because we were only seeing patients once they got admitted or seen in clinic with already have an advanced foot problem. We didn't really do routine foot care. We didn't screen patients. We didn't monitor high-risk patients. For offloading, we put them in some kind of shoe, usually a wide-toed shoe with a plastisote liner. That's about what most vascular surgeons did. And we did no prophylactic or reconstructive surgery for patients with deformities. And I would see patients, I'd do a bypass on, do a transmet, skin graft them, get them to heal. And they'd come back to clinic with their foot in aquinas and have a new ulcer. So even though we were doing a pretty good job, we weren't doing everything we could have. So I started thinking, well, what if we partnered with somebody else that did a lot of these things that we don't? So the things in blue there are things that vascular surgeons do really well, but the things in red are what podiatrists actually do really well. <coughs> so I went to a meeting about 10 years ago in Italy. It was in Brescia, actually, and, and Graziani gave this course. But this is one of the statues in Rome. It's the four great rivers of the world. And I use this just as an example because you need to have blood flow but you also need to have somebody that understands the foot a lot. So why not partner a flow component with a toe component and try to, to build something? So you, you got to work globally, nationally, as well as locally. So David Armstrong and I got <coughs> Pat, Pat Claggett at the time. He was the head of the SVS. George Andros was there. KCI was there. And we got the uh, American Podiatric Medical Association together. So let's just form an alliance. So that led to a... Uh, special supplement in the SVS, and the whole purpose of this was to try to get vascular surgeons and podiatrists to work together, because it seemed to me like a really logical construct to try to help these patients. So let me skip over some slides. So then if you kind of look at the stairway to amputation, it all starts with diabetes, then usually neuropathy, then an ulcer, right, because ulcers precede infection, precede um, amputation, and then they get infected sometimes, and then sometimes they're complicated by vascular disease. So if you kind of overlap here, what does a podiatrist do and what does a vascular surgeon do, they don't intersect a whole lot except both of us can debride feet. Those actually are my feet. I'm not diabetic and I don't have neuropathy, but I got to be on the cover. Um, so anyway, we set our whole service up to kind of go this way. And it's not the only way to do it, but to me it seems like the bare minimum you need to have to develop a foot service. So you can't have any vascular surgeon, you can't have any podiatrist, but you have to have at least one of each who really cares about this problem. They want to prevent amputations, they want to work together. And so we do that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how you triage them, but basically the basic principle we started with in Arizona and what I've tried to improve on at Baylor is all these patients, no matter who gets consulted first, both toe and flow see the patient. And then we kind of put them into three groups. This is mostly neuropathy. It's an offloading issue. It's, there's not a blood flow issue. Podiatry is going to manage that patient for the most part. Or if there's a pretty bad blood flow issue, the blood supply has to be fixed first. Or increasingly, there's a lot of patients in between. They have a little bit of ischemia. 
Their wound management may have not been very good, so what do you do with those? So then let's get back to the angioplasty bypass question. So this is an older paper from Craig Kent's group. When I first saw this thing, this, this was back in 95, there was this huge jump in vascular intervention. So I'm thinking, well, that's mostly being done for Claudicans and it's patients that probably could be treated by not smoking and exercise, not gonna do much for my limb salvage patients. And then you get somebody like Falia who writes this paper and basically almost all his patients get angioplasty first. This was an older paper, but I'm thinking that can't be the same patients I'm seeing. So, you know, when we start doing angioplasties and we start out with focal lesions, so this was a patient we just did an atherectomy on and pretty easily got two vessel outflow, so that's pretty simple stuff. And then this gets to be a little more complicated. This is a guy with a lateral foot wound that's not healing, renal failure, and I did his proximal stuff, but initially I couldn't get through this occlusion. Finally got through that to get flow back to his lateral foot. But how good is angioplasty? So we've seen a lot of talks today with long segment angioplasty, and as Dr. Montero just pointed out, the uh, at least in the tibial circulation, drug-coated balloons haven't shown any benefit yet like they have in the SFA. But if you take, uh, this is one of the most experienced groups in the world, so Schmidt and Scheinert from Germany, and if you look at tibial lesions that are longer than eight centimeters, um, and you angiogram them all at three months, 31% are open without restenosis, but two-thirds of them are either occluded already or have a restenosis. So that patient you just got presented where we're four months into it and the wound's not healed yet, it's going to be an issue if you're using endovascular therapy for longer lesions because that therapy is not likely to last long enough to get the wound healed. That doesn't mean you don't do it, but it means you have to be alert and either re-intervene or in some patients maybe you should have a bypass up front. I don't think we know that yet, but I do think, just kind of make a case here for pop-pedal bypass. So the advantage of pop-pedal bypass is you can use a shorter conduit. You can pick the best vein the patient has, so I often use thigh vein for these. Uh, it maximizes pedal perfusion and it lasts. So for a complex wound, this was a guy that had already lost his other leg but still worked and was ambulatory. I did him on Thanksgiving Day or the Thanksgiving the day after Thanksgiving Day. I did a little infection there, ended up with a ray amputation. And his toe pressure went up to 62 post-op. You skip incisions on his leg. And this graft is still open. This was done 11 years ago, still patent. As in this, the, the primary patency of, of pop pedal bypass at two years approaches 80%. So it's really durable. So this is other thing It made me think about is sort of how we got to Wi-Fi. So this is just an example. If you look at angioplasty versus bypass in patients with whatever critical limb ischemia is, in every category, the patency rate is better for bypass. And yet the limb salvage rates are identical, are pretty close to identical. So how can that be? How come you have something that's more durable and it probably provides better blood flow in some circumstances, but when you look at the whole group of patients that are being reported, no difference in limb salvage. And then you have the basal trial, which is taken, taken it in the shorts kind of for lots of limitations, but you start to see after one to two years, there's a divergence and the patients that got bypass first, if they were still alive, seem to do better. They not only have a higher limb salvage rate, but they actually live longer, which is interesting. So, let me skip over this. This was a paper, this was back in the bypass era, so this was when I was still at Arizona. It was over 300 consecutive bypasses for almost all for critical limb ischemia. And half, the point of this slide is half the patients were readmitted, some of which was planned, within six months and need, needed repeat foot procedures usually, and sometimes bypass procedures, but usually foot procedures to heal. And about half of them hadn't completely healed in three months, even with a patent bypass. So the point of that paper was actually it's a lot of work to try to salvage these limbs. And just because you've done the revascularization, you're not done yet. So that gets back to the question, how come the patency rates are different, but the limb salvage rates are the same? So I think that problem is something I've been fixated on for a while, is because we didn't really understand the disease had changed. It was no longer a pure blood flow problem, and the classification systems we had were inadequate. So the old Fontan system was a pure ischemia model. This was back when patients were mostly smokers and didn't have diabetes, and they progressed from asymptomatic arterial occlusions to rest pain with dependency, uh, relieved by dependency to um, claudication, rest pain, and then focal gangrene or advanced gangrene. 
And then Rutherford was a little better, but it and used hemodynamics, which they didn't really have it in the time of Fontaine. But basically, there's ischemic rest pain, which isn't a big problem in diabetics. And then all the people that are potentially have limb salvage are in this, this category five. And category six actually is major tissue loss where you really can't save a functional foot anymore. So now you have all these patients coming in, and they don't come in with typical vascular complaints. They come in with diabetes and some kind of foot wound. And increasingly, they're no longer just neuropathic. About two-thirds of those patients have neuroischemia. So how do you figure out, do you, do you angiogram every single person with a diabetic foot ulcer? And if you see a stenosis somewhere in the circuit, you pop it open and declare victory? Or do, how do you think about this problem? So it gets back to this. So the definition of critical limb ischemia comes from one one-page paper written in 1982. And interestingly, they, 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 the purpose of this was to try to come up with a group of patients whose ischemia was so bad, they were very likely to lose their leg if nothing were done. So they developed rest pain as one criteria based on certain hemodynamics. And then they recognized if you had a wound, you probably need a little bit better perfusion than you would have if you had no wound in order to not be at high risk. But what people forgot is this, this, this concept was never intended to be applied to patients with diabetes. And why is that? Because diabetics have neuropathy, so they don't always have pain, and then they frequently get infection. So infection was often ignored, and it was completely ignored in all the vascular classifications. So that gets back to our toe and flow paradigm. So up here, where if you measure perfusion in some way, palpable pulse, normal indesign and green scan, toe pressure is 80 with a great waveform, and a patient has a foot ulcer, that's going to be an offloading problem, sometimes a bony debridement problem. If there's an infection, you've got to drain it, but they're going to heal. And then you have these patients with no foot pulse, flat toe waveforms, and three dead toes. Well, that's not going to get better unless you revascularize them. But increasingly, you have all these patients in the middle, a smallish wound, maybe a touch of infection, and not quite normal blood flow. What do you do with them? So the point of this is that limb threat is a spectrum. It's not just, and the Rutherford Five put all those patients in one category. So a group of us, hmm. I'm not looking for the server, but that's interesting. I'm trying to. Ah, so here was the problem. We have these categories and this concept of CLI, which doesn't really apply to our patients anymore because we have all these patients with diabetes that just come in with foot wounds. And then we know from uridyl. So uridyl was interesting. They looked at patients who had PAD, which was just defined as an ABI of 0.8 or less. If they had PAD plus infection, it tripled their amputation risk. So here, look at this. So we have this system now that applies to pure ischemia. Our patients aren't purely ischemic, and we ignore probably the reason why most diabetics lose their leg, which is infection. So how do you weave all that together? So I kind of started thinking, I like Venn diagrams, but let's define the patient. So how sick are they? What are their comorbidities? Let's not, for, not get the anatomy yet. Let's talk about the limb. How bad is the limb? How much of a wound do we have? How ischemic is it? And is there infection? And then once you do those two things, then you start worrying about anatomy. But for 20 years, our specialty was focusing on the anatomy first, as if that were the sole determinant of limb outcome. So you can kind of envision on any given foot problem, there could be a tissue loss dominant situation. So for example, a frail patient with moderate vascular disease who breaks their hip, ends up, she ends up in the hospital, gets a big heel wound from pressure, not infected yet, may not be that ischemic either, that's a tissue loss dominant scenario. You could have a pure rest pain patient with no tissue loss yet. That's an ischemia dominant scenario. And then you could have a person that steps on a tack, has normal pulses, and gets gas in their foot. And they, by the time they come to the ED, their white count's 30, they're septic, they have gas up to their knee, they have normal blood flow, they're going to lose their leg from infection. So how do you put all those three things together? So we came up with a Wi-Fi, and I'm not going to go through all the details of that, but that was published almost exactly three years ago to try to categorize this. So all it was meant to do was stage the limb. So just like we stage cancer, would you go in for your cancer and get the same treatment for it regardless of what the stage was? Of course not. So why not stage a foot, which is a really common problem and costly, and basically we broke everything in. So wound, ischemia, and foot infection got broken down into there's not much of it, there's a little bit of it, there's a moderate amount, or it's severe. So. We, then we asked this guidelines committee, said, all right, let's play with this for a minute. We used to have Rutherford 5. Now I'm going to give you 64 possibilities, right, because it's 4 times 4 times 4. So there's 64 potentially possible patient scenarios. So we asked the guidelines committee, 16 people, 
do you think in this category, if you just treated this patient medically with optimal foot care and medical therapy but didn't revascularize them, what's their risk of limb loss? Put them in four categories. One, very low, low, moderate, high. And then second question was, what's the benefit of revascularization? So you can see a couple interesting things. This was all opinion-based, right? So patients with severe infection and big wounds are at high risk to lose their leg even if they don't have ischemia. So if you're looking at all comers when they come in, you can't ignore this group because you may not be able to prevent amputations here as if ask your surgeon unless your healthcare system gets better at preventing foot ulcers and treating diabetes, right? And then even for patients with mild to moderate ischemia, most people felt like their amputation risk was gonna be pretty high if they had much of a wound or any infection. And if you look at the benefit of revascularization, so only these people would classically be in the CLI definition, but you can see there's a lot of red here in the mild to moderate group depending on whether or not there's infection or ischemia. So how did that work out? Well, fortunately, the SVS came up with an app, so you can do this thing on an app. It's free. And we made this thing up. Somebody showed this graph earlier. This was totally made up. We just tried to guess it. Somebody said, what do you mean by very low amputation risk or high? And I kind of said, well, pick whatever you want. But we kind of drew this curve as what we anticipated would happen when people use Wi-Fi. So I'm not, I'm not gonna run through all these slides, but this was with first paper. This was from David Call, who trained with me when I was in the Air Force. And they took our curve literally, but this was what each Wi-Fi stage, this is the limb stage, which was the unique feature of Wi-Fi. So there's a bunch of classifications before that either were numerical or they looked at some of these factors, but they didn't then classify the limb in a risk stage based on that. So if you buy these stages, basically what they showed was wound healing, and amputation risk, and all these patients were revascularized. In this series, every single patient got revascularized. And the limb loss rate and wound healing rates were directly related to the stage of the limb at presentation. This was our own paper, so we, we didn't lose any legs in Arizona. These were all comers. So these were patients who had a wound. They were almost all diabetic, and they had a wound that required debridement in the operating room, or they got revascularized. Almost all the limb loss was in stage four patients. And that was led largely by renal failure patients with advanced ischemia. And then I think one of the UCSF folks is gonna talk a little bit about this later, but they looked at their series and basically for stage four patients, the limb salvage was better if they had a bypass than if they had endovascular therapy. And then the biggest series that was just reported in March's JVS from Darling's group in Boston, they looked at both open and endo revascularization. And this is the little grid of 64 scenarios, but you can see the largest percentage of limb loss is all in this lower right group where they have high grade ischemia, moderate to big wounds, and usually infection. Not much limb loss at all over here. So this shows you that there's some validity to this concept. So anyway, I summarize this in, in an editorial in JVS recently, but there's one error here, so for your own group from UCSF, I mistakenly put in the amputation free survivals here, but it doesn't change the gist of this table, which in almost 3,000, over 2,000 patients now, limb loss very low in the stage one patients, very high in the stage four patients, and intermediate in these two categories, suggesting we may, these may end up being merging, or some of these may bump up to here, so we may end up with three risk groups ultimately. But the concept here, so this, these are applied to different series. So some were revascularization only series. The Cull paper, the Baropoulos paper was actually non-diabetic patients that underwent endovascular therapy in Germany. Ward was a paper from USC looking at indigent patients. And Darling's paper was, was all revascularization, both open and endo. But the point was, even with therapy, which wasn't how this table was designed to begin with, right? We were, we were looking without revascularization. But even when you revascularize these patients, the stage of limb at presentation has a huge role to play in whether or not you're gonna be able to save the limb. So I think, in conclusion, that this rubric, at least, I think the concept is correct. I think thinking about the degree of wound, how much ischemia there is, and particularly infection, is really important and it's predictive. And if we're gonna start talking about what our limb salvage rates are, if we don't have the patient stage first, we don't really know how meaningful that is. And I think that no matter what therapy you, you could be, for example, in certain subgroups when you get to stage four, depending on what their anatomy is and their comorbidities, those people might need a primary amputation. It's not meant to dictate therapy, but it does give you a way to study patients. So in conclusion, I think the diabetic foot is like the canary in the mind. It's a way for us to redesign our healthcare system 
which has been designed to treat disasters, right? We're great with trauma. We're pretty good with MIs. We're not very good with chronic diseases. And what's a diabetic foot ulcer? It's a manifestation of not preventing and treating a chronic disease. So thank you very much for the honor of giving this talk, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here.